I am Joe Hage. I have the privilege of leading the medical devices group on LinkedIn. And one of the privileges it affords me is getting to know people like Paula, who over the last uh, couple of months I uh, have gotten to know and now consider to be a friend. So um, this LinkedIn thing works and you make real connections and Paula, as you probably know, is one of the most connected medical device and med tech recruiters in America. Um, and she is going to give us a great presentation about the job market ahead for 2014. And that's when I say, take it away, Paula. Terrific, terrific. Well, before we move on to the presentation, I want to make sure that everyone does see uh, that we do have, if you're having any trouble logging in, I do have my IT folks on standby, and they're warm, well, willing to help you get on the webinar. And also wanted to mention that uh, the Medical Devices Group is sponsoring a conference, the 10X conference, which is going to be in Minneapolis, another great city, uh, next year. So I hope everyone will be able to make uh, that meeting as well. So our topic today is uh, the medical device job market. And Joe was kind enough to put up a couple of polls talking about the medical device market space. I'm real appreciative for the folks that are joining us from outside the US. I will tell you that the majority of our focus will be on North America hiring. But certainly, with the global economy that we're in, it affects everyone. So the poll was asked uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, which of these uh, choices will most adversely affect the medical device recruiting space? And of the 100 votes, obviously the 2.3% medical device tax is of great concern. In fact, some of the comments that I noted on the poll, one from Jim Bloom, said that pricing pressures, pressures are the real culprit, um, and particularly with the uh, device, uh, medical device tax, less profit is less jobs. And Paul Stein, uh, so this is a uh, spread of opinion of what he predicts is going to happen in the future. So it seems like we're all on the same page. The second poll that was asked in prior to our, uh, our webinar today was, what will next year's headcount be in your company? And of course, this was a, a poll that was done. This is a selected group. 47 uh, votes were cast. But the majority looks like it's going to be uh, really a slight increase to slight decrease with, um, you know, my vote, uh, I guess, was uh, no, no change. So I'd like to dive in right now to the, the, the bulk of our, uh, our topic and tell you what we're going to do is I'm going to lay out some of the definitions and challenges that our, company, our, that our industry is dealing with. I'm going to talk about some overarching themes that we have and the particular audience that I think this will be the most benefit, benefit to will be startup small, emerging, and under-resourced company. So uh, I'm going to give some, uh, some trends and technologies about what I foresee going to be happening in next year. And then I'm going to unpack a ton of information. In fact, Joe will tell you I tend to be pretty passionate about what I do. I tend to speak at a pretty quick clip. So hopefully uh, the repay will be a, a benefit to you. And I will tell you that all the information that you're seeing today will be contained in a follow-up presentation with handouts, including some of the source information that I'm citing. And the last part of our conversation is going to be really some things to consider to be an employer of choice or how to work for one. So obviously, the medical device market space has been uh, really racked with a lot of problems. Uh, a lot of challenges. I've been in the industry since about 1984, which makes me sound a lot older than I, than I feel like I am anyway. Uh, and we've had our, our share of challenges from reimbursement issues, DRGs, and really the complexity of reimbursement that uh, has been taking place in the last few years. But nothing has been, I think, as potentially devastating as the uh, medical device tax that's being imposed. Certainly the uh, Affordable Care Act, you know, Obamacare, pricing issues, uh, the strain on capital markets, and even our government shutdown has been an issue. But I think that the government, uh, the 2.3% medical device taxes is, is a big, a big uh, uh, it's looming over everyone's mind. So it, this would not be a talk to the medical device industry without my commercial to ask everyone to go to the website no2.3.com and sign the petition to repeal this tax, which is placing more than a $30 billion tax burden on the medical device space. 
So as most of you know, in January this year, the uh, excise tax was levied. And I'd like to stop here. I know this is probably obvious to most people on the call, but if there's some folks that may not be aware, that tax is being levied regardless of whether or not a company is profitable. Um, I gave this talk last week, and there were a few people that did not realize that it was on the gross sales of a company, not the profitability. The slides you're looking at is showing some of the estimated layoffs that we've noted uh, based on press reports, and these are costing us good jobs. In fact, Avamed estimates that 43,000 jobs may be lost, and I was at Avamed a few weeks ago and uh, was listening to with great interest to uh, what the analysts and some of the uh, prognosticators were saying about our industry, and it was very mixed. I spoke at length with uh, folks from the compliance areas, from uh, certainly the people that are dealing with reimbursement issues, and it's certainly heavy on everyone's mind. And in fact, just a few days ago, Merck uh, announced that they would eliminate 8,500 jobs from marketing, uh, administrative, and R&D. So certainly the, the challenges are, are pretty, uh, pretty substantial. So there was a study conducted in January of this year by the Emergo Group and the study uh, polled over 1,000 folks in the healthcare space. And the numbers you're looking at are the 420 uh, responses that came from medical device companies who, uh, companies who identified themselves in the med tech space. Also of note, 80% of the companies that these people represented have fewer than 50 employees. And if you look at some of the issues that they're facing, certainly competition, pricing pressures, new product development. But the thing that was most interesting to me about this, uh, this study was that none of these problems are going to be solved without having the right people to take charge. So the options that we have as it relates to the hiring challenges companies are looking forward to are pretty dismal. Certainly, we can reduce staff. We can postpone hiring. We can decrease compensation. We can continue to ask more of current employees who are being taxed as it is. Or we can leverage the current resources we have to be more effective in our hiring. And it's that topic that I'm really going to be focusing on uh, for the majority of my conversation with you today. So I always like to, I'm the kind of gal when I was a little girl, I always tried to read the end of a story first. I was a voracious reader, but I was impatient. So I know that some of you are pressed for time, so I want to give the meat of the things that you can do to be an employer of choice, and then I'll be backing into some of the specific steps. So here's the end of the book, if your time is lim limited. Uh, to be an employer of choice, certainly you need to understand exactly who you are as an employer. I think in a, we're going to spend a little bit of time about how to engage your current uh, employees to reach your potential future employees using social media and other technologies. And then we're going to talk about uh, how you could make the process as painless as possible. And the fifth one is the one that I'm going to start with, and that's the one that I think is probably the most, uh, most difficult for small companies, and that is pay well. So I'm going to jump in, I said, with a lot of uh, documentation and a lot of kind of data points on where we are currently in the medical device space. This is information that was from salary survey, uh, salary survey and MD and DI graphic. So as you'll see here, this is executive talent. You'll see that the median, and we'll dive into this in a minute, the median salary for this group is $145,000. Um, these folks have been in, in the industry on average about 17 years and are responsible for pretty substantial budgets. Um, you'll notice that of this group, and this was done in January of this year, only about 6% are actively looking. 25% would consider a job uh, for the right possibility, but that this figure is really relatively low, which I think flies in the face of some of the data that's putting out there, being put out there now about the job market. More about that in a minute. The next area I'd like to look at is product development. And golly, we've had a lot of great technology in the med tech, biologics, and device space in the last year. This graphic demonstrates the median salary for product development engineers and shows that there was a slight decrease year over year. But the median salary, this is in all areas, 
uh, is $94,000. Um, these are folks that generally have been in the med tech space for about nine or 10 years. And you'll see that as of earlier this year, a little over 10% of those are actively looking. Two more. Regulatory legal affairs, one of the most exciting areas to be uh, uh, talking about these days. You know, I think of regulatory and legal affairs professionals as really in some ways um, like the Y2K uh, hiring frenzy, frenzy that we had uh, uh, 13 years ago. These folks, these back office critical members of our industry uh, are seeing more and more uh, opportunities because of the increased complexity of the MedTech's compliance space. And you know, at Avamed a few weeks ago, um, certainly there was a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, issues that were being brought up by the experts. So these folks have, I think, a, a pretty, good, uh, pretty good future in terms of their employment. Now, as an employer, though, you'll see that these folks are pretty, uh, pretty hemmed in to where they are. They're making, I think this is a little low now, but $126,000 as of earlier this year, and have had increases of about 10% in their base salary in the last year. And with R&D, same thing. Uh, these salaries are coming up about 10 to 12% a year. A typical med tech R&D employee has about 14 years of experience and is seeing increases uh, year over year. So, I want to guide, dive into those numbers just a bit, and as a, uh, a medical device company, give you some, uh, some uh, resources that can help you as you're deciding what it is to pay your folks. There's a lot of uh, companies out there that do salary information. We happen to use the Economic Research Institute information. And the data on the next slides is from their most recent study, which uh, was received in March of 2013. So, and I want to show you, and I promise all of our slides are not this complicated, but in terms of data, I want to show that there really is a huge range of uh, compensation for all of the areas that we're going to be discussing. I'm going to pause on this slide for a minute because I think this has, this is taking the slides you saw before and making it a little bit easier to read, I hope. Uh, so this slide represents respondents to ERI studies as well as information contained from publicly available data sources. And I want to demonstrate the, uh, the range of base salaries in these, uh, these particular titles from the 25th percentile up to the 75th percentile. I'll also note that the people responding or from publicly available information that 18.8% of CEOs were female, and 11% identified themselves as non-white. Uh, the range for a COO, again, is, is incredibly varied, and in fact, it goes all the way up, if we look at the 95th percentile, to well over $1.1 million. Um, looking at some other job titles, I believe that this is, again, a trailing indicator of what's going on in our marketplace right now. Uh, in terms of salaries, but the uh, chief compliance officer in a medical device company has a, a lower percentile, is a 25th percentile of about $80,000 up to about 110. Marketing directors vary uh, obviously as, as much as, um, as any, and a top product development executive in terms of base can go at a 25th percentile from 150 all the way up to uh, $256,000. Finally, I want to point out some of the uh, more field level, uh, street level, individual contributor roles. Medical sales, and there's a lot of uh, data out there about what a medical sales rep makes. Uh, but certainly, this is taking into account the highs and the lows, working for distributors, working for high-end capital equipment manufacturers. But uh, at the lower end, you'll see a salesperson earns about, in base, about 56000 uh, all the way up to a uh, more senior person in the 75th percentile up to $142,000. Now, that's a lot of data. That's a lot of numbers. But what does it mean? So I talked to some uh, folks in the industry that I consider to be wonderful colleagues and real, uh, uh, real experts in the area. I spoke to Drew DeAngelis, who is a retained recruiter working primarily in the orthopedic and spine space, and we got to talking about really what we can do to help our companies hire top talent. 
And you know, he laid out, and this will be in the handouts that we'll be sending after the webinar. And we talked about the things that can really help companies. And he says, you know, Paula, he says, uh, A players are seldom applicants, which I think is so true. Uh, and he says, it's really about, uh, for the companies that want to hire, you've got to pay what the market bears. All the numbers we looked at prior shows a huge diversity. But there's a correlation between the companies that pay well and the companies that do well. So I guess the first message that I'd like to leave on a very top-end basis is to pay your folks appropriately. Now, not all companies are in the position to be able to pay high dollars, and there's other things that you can do to certainly uh, be able to attract players. But, uh, but paying people in this marketplace is going to be a real determinant of the type of folks that you're able to recruit in the future. Paula, it's and Joe. I'd like to interject. I, I can't mm -hmm. let the last slide stand without making a comment. Mm -hmm. um, Drew said that A players are seldom applicants. I'd be willing to bet that we have a number of displaced A players on this call. Um, you know, economy takes over and, you know, I'm really, really good at what I do, but I'm left without a seat right now. How do you respond? Well, I think it's a relative great question, and it's a good distinction. Uh, and in terms of, of A players, there are some folks that have been hit by, you know, gosh, the mergers and the, uh, you know, the layoffs that are really beyond their control. But I think the message is that, Joe, uh, you know, year after year, uh, the A players are going to find their place in top organizations. And, and certainly, uh, folks that have been uh, displaced for years and years at a time, you know, there tends to be either they're not in the right position or they're not in the right uh, type of organization. But I think you know the uh, you know the overall theme is uh, you know A players will find their way to a company. Now nowadays it may take a little bit longer because of the economy, but um, they'll still be sought over. And one other note, you know, folks that are at the higher end of the pay range, you know, folks that are making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars it really does take longer to seat them in those positions. So that wasn't meant to be an insensitive comment. It's just that um, you know, in this economy where there is, we're turning into a candidate-driven uh, environment in most areas, the people that are sought after, the people that are well-known in the industry will come out on top. It may take them a little while, but they'll get there. Did that answer the question, Joe? I'm assuming so. Yes, thank you. So, yes, I have put sure. myself back on you. Thanks. Great. So, uh, so I think in terms of, uh, of companies being able to present opportunities to individuals, you know, I see uh, companies making offers you know, you know, periodically, and, and they'll say, here's the base, here's the, the variable, here's our, our, comp, or here's our, um, uh, here's our uh, perk package. So I think when you're, when you're talking to these uh, top individuals, you want to point out you know, that the base and the benefits and the whole package, you want to be able to present everything uh, as a package to someone in terms of their total value, uh, not just the base and the variable. So I want to move to a, a different area now. I ha have a conversation with several other recruiters, including um, uh, Brian Cole. And we talked about the fact that our companies, in order to be competitive in finding top talent, need to really make sure that they have a mobile and social strategy. So the first iPhone came out June 2007. I remember where I was. I was at an orthopedic meeting. And I will tell you, at that meeting, uh, the few people that had uh, procured their iPhones uh, we were as busy looking at all the technology on the phone as we were the technology of some of the orthopedic products. So, and any parent will find this is no surprise that people have their phones with them just about all the time. In fact, there was a Comscore study that said that people ages 18 to 44 have their smartphones with them 22 hours a day. And that, and I love this statistic, 79% of people will reach for their phone within 15 minutes of waking. And I'll tell you, that's faster than my husband sometimes reaches for me in the morning. So, and in fact, as I'm having this webinar now, I'm assuming that at least half of you are probably looking at a tablet or surfing on your iPhone or multitasking with another medium. 
So it's important to be able to do a, have a strategy that captures information about your company as an employer of choice, not just in the traditional internet space, but also in the mobile space. Uh, this is a slide that depicts that 84% of the people indicated that they spent 132 minutes or more a day on their smartphones. But here's the part that's really telling Joe. You'll see that only 16% of those 132 minutes were spent on actual phone calls. People are using smartphones, tablets, I heard a new term, phablets, uh, the other day to find all kinds of information, including looking for information about your company and a potential job. Now, 77% of people as of June of this year are going to be looking for jobs on their smartphones. And in fact, if you send out communication to someone in regard to an opportunity at your company, 70% of them will respond within an hour if they receive it on their mobile device. Whereas if they see it on a traditional desktop, it takes them almost an hour. Now, to be clear, this is uh, reading the information, acting on it, could be just deleting it. But if you don't have a mobile strategy for helping engage with potential hires as well as your current employees, then it's going to be more difficult for you in 2014. So I want to spend a few moments talking about some things that you can do to leverage technology in your interview process. Uh, and in fact, um, I was interested to see, this is a bit of a sign to medical device, but I was interested to see that Pfizer has started in the UK having digital detailing. Now, I don't know how I feel about taking salespeople out of the effect. I do know how I feel about having salespeople taken out of the, question, of the equation, but, the, but the, the theme here is technology has got to be a component of your ability to hire people in 2014. There's a couple of things that you can do to really help leverage, even if you're a small company or an under-resourced company. I have a, one of my favorite clients is uh, in the Southeast, and it's a wonderful company, high tech, they do a great job, they're well regarded. But the problem with this company in terms of being able to attract and, and to hire great people is their interview process takes a long time. Not their fault, necessarily, because these folks are uh, working 60 hours a week. They're, you know, they're flying all over the world. But one solution that we've introduced is to have video interviewing. And in fact, video interviewing, which is pretty inexpensive, has grown by 49% in the last year. And you think about it, if you're a small company and there's somebody that you want to connect and get to, this would be a great way to be able to have the process go quicker. So it replaces um, phone screens. It certainly saves on travel. And there are several companies that have really cropped up in the last few years to uh, really be able to cater to this market. Um, so interview stream is one. Um, iMeet is one. A higher view is one. There's several others, but if you're looking for a way to uh, be able to get to the right people quicker, I would definitely encourage you to look into video interviewing. The second technology that I think that um, small companies, under-resourced companies, really any company can look to into to help things go faster is to automating reference checks. We use Skill Survey. And um, it's a, a wonderful, there's, there's other services out there. But think about it, how many times you get someone that you're incredibly interested in, you go to do a reference or background check, and either you can't get a hold of the people, or it's difficult to schedule a time, or when you call, they say, hey, I can tell you they worked here between this date and this date. So this is a terrific and a real cost-effective solution for your company to be able to automate reference check. It's really simple. The candidate puts in the emails uh, of the folks that are the references. Well, you can add a few others to it. And it goes to the, uh, to the respondent's uh, email, and they can respond in a survey form. The best part about it is it's aggregated and it's anonymous. So we have found that by using this technology, uh, instead of taking uh, you know, a long time to do kind of that, that early level reference check, uh, we're able to really vet out candidates on a, uh, from their background quite a bit quicker. 
So reference checking would be something else to look at. I want to jump into um, a, a section now on your value proposition as a uh, as a, a hiring as an employer of hire for next year. So this is a, a screenshot of uh, a whiteboard in our office, and I ask my people periodically, "Gosh, wh why do you work here? Why would somebody else want to work here?" And I told Joe today, I did not realize until yesterday that of our 11 employees that work here in Orlando, we have four that are off-site, all but one was a referral from someone that we knew. And you know, talking to people you know about your company and about um, uh, the value they may bring and using your network is going to be a critical thing for companies to do next year. I'll point out that uh, the company Dog Jackson was actually higher on the list, but I moved it down a little bit just to uh, uh, just to make myself feel better. So, so here's a, this is a, uh, a, a an article from Laura Nobles from Nobles, Nobles Communication, which is a PR and marketing firm that works exclusively in med tech. And in talking to Laura, I said, "Hey, you know, kind of give me the sense of you, you've worked with companies that have uh, issues with um, you know their media disasters. How do you turn around when you need to hire for those same companies?" And you know, she pointed out, she says, "Paula, you know, Candidates really want to know five things. Will I be respected? Will I be encouraged? Can I trust the people I'm working for? Do I have a passion about what it do? And is this a place where I can enjoy working for a number, you know, a long period of time? And you'll notice that in the top five, there's no mention in this particular study of money. In fact, money was driver number seven. So as you're thinking about what your company is in the marketplace to potential hires, make sure that you tell your story authentically. Um, you know, it's it's something that you've got to to come to grips with where you are. And if you know what, you've got to ask the hard questions to your current employees. Maybe pull the marketplace, and then make sure that you set the stage for where you want to be. I love her her phrasing here: bake culture into your internal and external communications as it relates to hiring. So the, the last area, I did mention I talked to Brian Cole, who is the managing partner of the medical device practice at Kay Bassman, another terrific recruiting firm. And um, so he was talking about, you know, Paul, we've got to make the process more simple. He says, uh, you know, too many times our companies will, uh, you know, hiring companies will make so many hoops for people to jump through that it really becomes problematic for folks to get through the process. In fact, in the information that you'll be getting after today's call is a terrific video that his firm has put together on winning the war for talent for, uh, for really any size company. But he also says, you know, it's, it's a matter of making things more clear. So as you are looking to, uh, to pull in folks to your company, make sure that your hiring process is defined. Look at the specs of the job and make sure that it's not a job description from 1987. Simplify the process. Make sure that uh, your candidates, as well as your hiring managers, know exactly what the process is. Because what happens is if it takes too long, hiring fatigue sets in. And that's both on the candidate, fall, uh, the candidate side as well as the, the client side. So this is a screenshot of what I think is one of the best companies in the world for branding who they are as an employer. I've competed against Stryker in the past know them well as a company, have worked for them in various capacities on the recruitment side. But I'll tell you, this is an absolute uh, you know, hallmark of how to appeal to, uh, to potential employees. But guess what? Stryker's not for everyone. Uh, and even in a small company, some of the elements that they have in this, uh, in this uh, web shot really can be done on a fairly inexpensive level. I'd like to show you a, this is a, a company called Imacore, which is a small company with a lot of passionate people, not a lot of dollars. It's a, certainly it's a private company and it's, it's fairly early stages. And I spoke to Sherry Lyons, who is their uh, director of HR, and she's like, hey, Paula, we're a great company. How do we get the word out? And so we talked about them crafting a message statement about who they are as an employer. 
And so Sherry did a wonderful job of, of a very simple uh, graphic and put it on her uh, LinkedIn profile. And when I spoke to her yesterday, she says, hey, Paula, I have gotten hundreds and hundreds of hits. This is a little small, but it's basically what it's like to work at Imacor. And she says, resulting in at least one hire. So if you are, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be something that's shot on a, someone's camera phone. You can have a contest uh, among your employees for shooting something to really show who you are as a company. Another really good example of, uh, of a smaller company that is really trying to leverage and to build their brand as a, uh, as who they are as a, an employer is Cadence out of Charlottesville, Virginia. Wonderful company is a contract manufacturing and design company, and uh, the company's been in a huge growth curve in the last few years in terms of their revenue. And so one of the things they wanted to do is they have a culture at Cadence. Uh, that just makes you makes you want to work there if in fact you're you're in that area, and so they have a wonderful uh, search, you know, very inexpensive but a wonderful search capacity on their website. They have testimonials, and this is from a young man who went to a community college and was hired. It was it's nothing fancy. It wasn't scripted. It's just talking about why he likes to work at Cadence, and then I got a little tickle out of there. Uh, the year in review video, which started out with uh, some pop culture references to the year 2012, and frankly, I think any movie that's got Honey Boo Boo in it's got to be uh, got to be fun to watch. So, for not a lot of money, your company can really brand who they are as an employer. A couple of tips: make sure that your employers talk about the things that they're working on, and about uh, the fact that your company is not just uh, a bunch of cubicles with the people that are disconnected. Uh, employers or employees in the future are going to want to feel passion behind the companies that they work for. So I would very much consider, have you consider putting together a company culture, who we are as, who, you know, how, how we are to work for uh, video. So I want to, I told Joe, I, I always prepare, anytime I give a talk, twice as much information as I can cram into a session. So I have a natural stop here. I will tell you the follow-up materials are pretty substantial and have a whole lot more information, but I want to kind of, uh, kind of end with or, or kind of start to wind down on where you can find uh, quality hires. And I'll tell you, you know, LinkedIn, golly, uh, you know, we, we pretty much link, live on LinkedIn in my business. I have four monitors in my office, which is uh, it looks like a cockpit of, in an airplane sometimes, just a whole lot of information. And one of mine is almost always open to LinkedIn. So if you're not leveraging LinkedIn to find uh, hires, then you're, you're, you're missing out. It's fairly inexpensive. They have some paid options. But just having your employees mention job opportunities within their social networks, within LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, um, I think can really help bring people and make them aware and start engaging with your potential hires. You know, the, uh, the workforce is really starting to change. This is a little scary for me as a boomer here. Uh, in today's workplace, we make up about 38% of the, uh, the current workforce. But watch what happens when, I'll point out here, uh, Gen X is about 32% traditionals, which are people born the World War II generation, born 1946 or earlier. Watch what happens for 2020. You'll notice that Generation 2020, or Generation Y, or whatever you want to call it, is starting to emerge and starting to, want you to uh, come into the workplace by 2020. The boomers are down to uh, 22%, and the millennials will comprise 50% of the workplace. So with the new healthcare jobs that we have um, in existence now, or that are, are coming into play now, uh, we need to make sure that to be an employer of choice, you appeal to all the demographics that are targets for your uh, potential company. Last story. So I said I was, uh, I've was i been traveling a lot. I've been to a lot of conferences. I'm going to the Medical Innovation Summit in Cleveland next week, if any of you are there. But one of the most fun um, uh, uh, topics or, or seminars I've attended recently was sponsored by Deloitte. And the, in this topic, they uh, started with the shot from the TV show Homeland Security showing the vice president's pacemaker being hacked. And it made me think, you know, as it relates to job, 
how many jobs we have now that didn't exist 10 years ago. A product security officer, who would ever think that we would need somebody to make sure that our devices weren't, weren't hacked into? Mobile app developer, uh, certainly the FDA camp came down with their new guidelines a few weeks ago on medical apps. Social media product manager, another huge growth area, user in, uh, experience uh, designer, people that are dealing with uh, designing products that are usable, and even some of the, uh, the, the jobs that are in the healthcare IT field that are being uh, really expanded as a result of the uh, Affordable Care Act. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenging couple of years for us, but I think there's some bright spots. So I want to reiterate, there's five things I think that today you should do or consider in order to position yourself for next year. Number one, make sure you know what your value proposition is and make sure your employees know. Second, we said engage through social media because if, if, uh, if you're not getting the message out, uh, through your, your current employees, it's going to be more difficult to push the information out on a corporate level. Make sure your employees are happy with uh, working for your company, and if so, make them ambassadors for your company. Make the hiring process easier. Uh, make the requirements very clear. And lastly, I always in on this, when you can, pay well. So at this time, I will turn the microphone or, uh, back over to, to Joe and be happy to take some of your questions. And there are a lot of them. Uh, first, I'll start by sending uh, to the entire audience my personal email address. And um, if we don't get to your question um, in the next 20 minutes, you are welcome to follow up with me directly, and we'll get you an answer. So I hardly know where to start, but I am going to uh, start with Perry Robinson's question. Okay. And he wants to ask, uh, what can A players who are looking for work do on LinkedIn and uh, elsewhere to market themselves. And Perry, if I paraphrased you properly, just let me know. And uh, if not, you can type me a note. Hey, Perry, it's a great question. And there's a lot of terrific resources out there for those A players that are looking uh, to, to, for their next opportunity. I'll tell you, LinkedIn is, is a blessing and a curse. Um, it, you know, I think folks LinkedIn is a real easy way to connect with their network and by sending out uh, really kind of blanket messages to the world you really get nowhere so Perry here's some specific things that you can do in your job search on LinkedIn number one make sure that you are connecting to people that you've worked with in the past it's a simple thing but I look at folks that uh, have you know 20 or 30 connections uh, and are looking for positions and I'm wondering either they don't have a network or they've not taken the time to expand their network into the, the social space. And I think uh, another thing that you could do is um, certainly LinkedIn has some um, I'm actively looking uh, options that you can do. I do look at that as a recruiter. Uh, I have a different type package on LinkedIn than you might potentially as an employee to me. So if I see that somebody is open to opportunities, uh, then, then that helps me know that you know, you're more apt to call. But the third one, pair is probably the most critical. When you're looking for opportunities uh, using LinkedIn as a primary medium, make sure you're reaching out to people that you can co-help. So in other words, uh, if I'm calling you for a job and it's not a fit for you, the best thing you can do to get on anybody's radar, whether it's a search firm or whether it's a, a company, is to be a knowledge broker. So a good response would be in an email, hey, Paula, you know, not the right job for me, but let me introduce you to Bob or Mary or Sue. So those are three quick things. And Perry, if you'll uh, message me back, I have a whole blog about uh, how to find a job on LinkedIn. I'd be more than happy to send. Thank you, Paula. Um, I have the next question from a number of people, so uh, for a half dozen of you, um, a popular question is, what if I am junior, recently out of school, uh, or looking to transition into the medical device industry? What are the best strategies for me? Well, obviously, I uh, would love to have you in. It is, it is a wonderful field to, be, to, to, to aspire to. But I think in terms of, of kind of that entry level or transitioning things, there's a couple of really clear uh, suggestions that we would make. Number one, by golly, research the companies you want to work for. 
it amazes me that uh, people will, will be contacted about a job and then we'll say, tell them, you know, what do you know about the company? And if you say, gosh, here's what I found on the internet, you know, you're obviously not going to be a fit. So number one, research the companies you really want to work for. There's some great resources. A lot of them are free. Um, a lot of them are, are small paid subscription. But when you're early and you're looking for a job, target the companies you want to work for. Find out if it's device or if it's robotics or it's biologics. Find out the ones that are in your neighborhood or in your area. Hoover's is a great example for that. But also, even on LinkedIn, there, in fact, I wish I could pull it up, Joe, but since we're live, I won't. On LinkedIn, if you uh, go and you start researching companies, there's people also viewed. There's a section, if you look at a company, it says people also viewed. So target the company you want to work for. Secondly, make sure your resume is golden. I got to tell you, a resume is, and I look at a resume on average for between three and five seconds. That's it before I decide, do I want to know more? So if you don't have a stellar resume, invest in one. If, uh, uh, if, if finances are tight and people say, what do you want for Christmas, by golly, or for the holidays, by golly, get yourself a resume that makes a lot of sense. In fact, the, the company we always recommend is the resume group. There's a lot of good resume services out there, but the resume group is, uh, uh, I think, is, is a leading company. And also, in your resume, make sure, this is critical, make sure you've got a lot of keywords in there on the jobs that you're looking for. And for the group, also um, in the presentation that you'll get, uh, we have a medical device interview prep guide that I'll send. And on there is three pages of how to research companies in the medical device space. Uh, to everyone, I just sent a link to uh, Sue Sarkeesian in the resume group. So you can click on that and reach out to her directly. Um, Paula, I, I got to jump the questions uh, because I, I'm really intrigued. You know, we put all this time into our resumes and you're looking at it for five seconds. So what's yeah. the magic formula? <laughs> magic formula is uh, make sure, and again, this is, this is an over 50s preference, but uh, make sure it's easy to read. Uh, I think a resume, and of course Sue is the resume expert, but uh, I think a resume should be no more than two pages. Now, if, you, if it's a CV, if you're an R&D, if you have a lot of patents, if you're an engineer, you know, send me a two-page concise uh, CV or resume, and then send a, a, you know, certainly information to follow. And when I say I look at for five seconds, that's to decide, is this person someone that's a fit for something that I'm, I'm looking, uh, looking for in the future? So secondly, make sure that you don't have your picture or um, any personal information because uh, with the elevated privacy concerns in the U.S. these days, you know, these are resumes that unfortunately we have to peel the information off. So make sure you don't have that information uh, on your resume. And also, this is the, the, probably the best of all, target the resume for the job. Now, I know that sometimes you're just looking in general for a position, but if you're contacted by a company or by a, a recruiter for a specific job, make sure that you absolutely customize that resume for that position. Um, and again, in that, the medical device prep guide, and everything, of course, is free, um, there's some really good ways, to have, uh, really good suggestions for customizing your resume on, uh, for a specific job. Uh, so those would be really three. There's a lot more, Joe, but, uh, but that, those would be three I definitely would start with. Uh, after the uh, presentation, I'm going to make all these links available on, the, uh, on this page. Let me find it for everyone. In the meanwhile, um, Janet asks, what should sales reps be able to do in the future that is not expected of them today? Oh, great question. Um, this is a, a, a general response, but you know, Janet, one thing you need to make sure you do as a salesperson is keep your technical skills current. More and more sales reps are doing presentations on iPads or presentations virtually. In fact, there was a, a gal that was hired for one of our clients a few weeks ago, and she blew me away with her presentation because she had every type of communication style covered before she went to the interview. She had an iPad version, she had a written version, and she was smart enough to realize that depending on what level uh, of person that she'd be interviewing with, she wanted to communicate them as they wanted to be communicate, 
communicated with. You know, the golden rule is to do is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The platinum rule is do unto others as they would have them have you do unto them. So uh, being able to communicate, Janet, using technology is critical. The other thing is make darn sure that you keep, and I hate the phrase brag book because it's so cliche, we call it a professional profile. But keep every uh, you know, atta girl, every atta boy, every sales ranking, be sure that you document your sales results all through your career. And if you're early in your career, uh, you know, I would keep those things because they, you know, you never know 10 years from now, you won't remember that you were sales rep of the quarter in, you know, uh, 10 years ago, but it's something that may show a track record for success in the future. And I think finally, uh, Janet, as you're, as you're deciding you know, really the track you want to, to take in the future, as a salesperson, make sure that you're networking not just with your current company, but uh, assuming that uh, you know, there will come a point where you want to look outside your current organization. Use trade shows and expositions and you know, even competitive, uh, talking to competitors uh, to really find out what's outside your company. The biggest beef that we have with uh, field sales representatives wanting to go to the next level, national sales manager, regional sales manager, business development manager, outside a local market, is they're so uh, uh, hemmed down, head down, really trying to forge and maintain relationships in their current market that they're unaware of what else is out there. So I would, uh, you know, if you're in orthopedics, you might look at the next band out uh, and look at orthopedic robotics. Or if you're in uh, cardiovascular, you might look at, uh, you know, something that's uh, in the cath lab. So I think being aware of what's out there beyond your current uh, domain is, is a, a real critical thing for salespeople that are looking to go to the next level. Paula, I have a number of questions that are geo-specific. So I recognize we don't have time to talk about every market, but okay. for example, um, what does the medical device market look like in Seattle from Cassandra? I'd like to hear about Tennessee from John. How about Charlotte? How about Canada? Uh, how about international? What can um, candidates who are pretty set in their geography, don't want to move, uh, can't move their families, uh, what's the best uh, hyper-geographical uh, approach to finding work? You know, I think that I certainly understand that people get to live. It's, it's one of the choices we can make in life. You get to live where you want to live most of the time. So I think in terms of specific markets, I'll tell you, it, it just as a, a broad view, Joe, it's really spiky. And this is a, a very 30,000-foot know, view. But I will tell you, Boston is hotter than a firecracker. Um, you know, I, I, and I can't give you the specifics because I, I can't pull them up right now, but the Boston market, the Dallas market is incredibly hot. Uh, Silicon Valley obviously is a hotbed, and of course, you know, in Silicon Valley, we're also competing in the med tech space with companies like Apple and Oracle and Google, and, or actually not Google, but, uh, you know, folks that are outside of the med tech space. So if you're looking for information that is specific to your geography, there's a couple things you can do. Number one, find a, a recruiter or someone uh, that you respect that really has a handle on that market space. Uh, not all recruiters uh, work globally. Some of them work specific to an area. And in fact, uh, there's several resources online, and Joe will include that too, uh, to be able to work with folks in your geography. And I think the other thing is there's resources online. Indeed's got a pretty good site um, in terms of, of where hi what the hiring market is, uh, but I think really finding somebody that's in your geography because there's just like, there's, there's too much information to share on a, a broad call like this. Thank you. Uh, Michael wants to know if you would speak, please, a bit more about uh, jobs that will be in higher demand in the coming year. Oh, absolutely. So most people know that um, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is, and again, I apologize, I don't have the slide up here, but uh, is an area where, uh, at least in North America, we're having uh, some real issues finding people. In fact, there was an article, and it's, it was on LinkedIn a few days ago, um, that uh, was showing that uh, a bunch of employers were saying we can't find enough people in that engineering space. So even if you're an English major, or even if you have a degree in women's studies or a, a non-engineering uh, or STEM type uh, skill, or education rather, I would very much look to 
uh, improve or enhance my education that would allow me to be in those technical spaces. Um, right now, we're struggling to find the right people at that mid-level for our engineering, robotics, anything that's embedded. Sensors are huge right now. Um, so anything with technology uh, is, is obviously you know, going to continue to be a huge play in the future. And I think, too, in terms of med tech, biologics uh, is obviously on a, a big upturn right now. So people that are working in that biologic space but you know, Joe, it, it, we're going to need people in quality, regulatory, sales, marketing, pretty much in all the categories to meet the demand. The key is the employees that are the candidates are the ones that are going to be in the most demand are going to have a technical component to them. So, um, so you know, any of those would be a, a huge place to go. In fact, I think it's been pretty well publicized that 10 of the 20 fastest growing uh, categories in terms of job growth are in healthcare. Now, a lot of those are allied health in terms of the nursing, the clinical side of things, but that's going to drive jobs in the med tech space as well. So uh, for those of you particularly uh, that are baby boomers that are in, in my generation, if you are not um, as comfortable with a smartphone as uh, your kids are, I would very much encourage you to uh, keep your skills or to improve your skills on the technical side. Uh, in fact, Joe, I'm going to I'm going to going to ask a or, uh, say a question that I get asked all the time, and, and it's a very sensitive subject. So, I know there's a lot of folks that are looking to get into the medical device space that are at the early side, you know, the early stage of their career. But I will tell you that I get calls every day from folks that are, you know, uh, in, over 50. Uh, over 60 people that are smart and that are engaged and that are knowledgeable and are struggling to, to find positions. So um, I know it's I know it's difficult. So kind of a broad brush. I tell folks on your resume, uh, you know, it's the last 10 to 15 years that matter. So if you have experience that uh, that really shows that you are in that that protected class category, the over 50 category, um, I would encourage you to consider taking that information off. And I think, too, um, you, know, as the, uh, you know, as the talent pool does start to age, golly, I love uh, finding people that are you know, all spectrums of the, the age categories, these you know, young, aggressive folks. But you know what? There's over 50 and aggressive and energetic as well. So it's a, it's a tough space to be in um, when you know, jobs do start to, to, to tend to go to that, quote, up-and-comer side. Uh, you know, there's EEOC protections behind that, but there's also practical reasons why companies should hire uh, folks with experience. You need to have all the generations uh, really represented to have folks with the wisdom and the experience, and then people that may have a fresher educational experience. So I'll, I'll throw that one in there to have both ends of the, uh, the age spectrum or the, uh, you know, the, the stage of work spectrum. I have to give you an on-air uh, kudos. I'm getting a lot of comments here about how great this webinar was. So thank you. Oh, Paul. thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Um, so, but you're not done yet. I'm not done with okay. you. I still have questions for you. In fact, quite a number. Um, the next question I want to ask you is uh, one that I touched on earlier. But there's a lot of people who are in transition from one industry to the next. So they weren't in med tech before, they weren't in medical device, or uh, I have one guy who wrote, do I have to do a sales rotation before I get the marketing job that I want? Talk us in general, because there are hundreds of people on the call, what do you do when you know, you're, you're not filling the spot with, hey, I did everything that you asked for in the job description. I did other things, but I know I can do it. So what's the right answer? How do you approach that? Oh, this, this is an easy one. So if you're coming out of, say, uh, the insurance business um, or the banking business or something that really is not a science-related field at all, because we, we get a lot of folks, I think that uh, you know, it, it certainly can be more of a challenge. If you're in a technology field already, by golly, a lot of the skill sets are, are really uh, translatable to the med tech side. So here's what I do. When you find a job that's of interest, take the job requirements and translate those specifically into a translatable experience you've had in another industry. I think, Joe, sometimes it, you know, it's so easy for companies and I'll, uh, you know, recruiters, and I mean, gosh, we're guilty sometimes 
to try to find uh, you know an exact match, uh, you know the the easy hire. Someone's like, oh yeah, they five years of this, great, you know you, you're you're up. But I think what really this the art of finding the right type of talent comes in is people that uh, if you can get to a candidate that can very uh, easily communicate how their their experience is translatable. So again, I hate, I hate to point back to it, but the medical device interview prep guide has a has a, a section in there about transferring your uh, out of industry experience into medical. So if uh, any of you on the call are in telecommunications or in defense or in consulting or in avionics or any of the technology driven fields, by golly, uh, med I said by golly twice, you can tell I'm a, I'm a Georgia girl, uh, but, but if you can translate those experiences over to medical specifically, and that goes back to the point I made on one of the earlier questions, which is research the company that you're working for. Uh, if you know that HL7 experience that you had at a telecom company uh, would be translatable to a software, a med tech software development company, make sure you understand how some of the alphabet soup of regulation transfers. Um, so it, it's really knowing the company you work for and being able to communicate how your experience is translatable. I think we have time for two, maybe three questions. Um, okay. One of them is you mentioned in the presentation that we are going to a candidate-driven market. As an employer, should we be using recruiters? Uh, should we save that money? Um, and perhaps also for those uh, on the call who are looking for work, go with the recruiter, try it on your own. What are your thoughts? I recognize that you recruit for a living, so you may have a biased answer. Ah, well, I definitely do, but that, so let, let, let me break it down to, uh, to a couple components. You know, if you're looking for work um, or you're looking for a better opportunity, certainly you want to use uh, all the resources that you have available. You know, I think, frankly, your immediate network, people that know your work, could vouch for you, is, is certainly uh, the best place to start. I think that in, again, really targeting the companies you want to work for, the type of companies you want to work for, makes a lot of sense. We are moving in some areas, not all, to a candidate-driven market. And what that means is, you know, in the past, a couple years ago, with the unemployment rates being in the, the double digits, um, it was really a company-driven marketplace where people could really uh, be, you know, be very uh, pick and choose who they wanted. But what's happening now is, you know, we have, in fact, Joe's a great statistic, we track our, our placements. And we have one in four, I don't know if I should admit this or not, but one in four of the offers that we extend um, are, but there's a counter offer or an alternate offer involved. So, you know, we are getting to the point where the people that um, are known players in the industry are really having multiple offers. And in fact, by the end of the year, I would imagine that one in three, the way our statistics are going, will have uh, more than one offer. So, you know, recruiters are paid by the companies to find the very best talent. And when I was talking to some of my colleagues about doing this call, I said, you know, this really is intended to help people that uh, really, you, we don't, you don't need recruiters in every case. Uh, you know, some of my best clients will say, you know what, I'm the one that you call if you've got a, uh, a confidential search, which is the, the primary uh, the primary percentage of what we do. If somebody is being um, uh, separated from the company, you need a replacement of place, great. If you've got you know, a, a ton of fills to do and you can leverage your employees, your social network, and technology to find people without uh, paying a recruiter, terrific. We're really snipers that can uh, find that that great hire when it's a difficult to fill search, or it's a confidential search, or it's something at a high enough level that you want to really get outside of your immediate corporate community. Um, so you know, there's, there's, this is a great business to be in, uh, but there's you know there's certainly room there for small companies to find great hires on their own in a lot of cases, and saving that expensive uh, you know recruiting fee. Uh, for those hires that are absolutely critical or confidential. I wish we had more time for questions. I, I'm sorry, we have you know maybe two dozen more that we didn't have a chance to get to, but uh, I commit to sharing them all with Paula and that uh, we answer each of your questions. Is that fair? That would be great. That would be great. So um, I'll close by saying I'm very, very grateful for your time, Paula. I knew this would be a blowout webinar. Um, 
and you'll have a chance to meet Paula in person in Minneapolis in May. So I'll put a link here for everybody to uh, the 10X conference. She is a member of our new uh, advisory board, which I'll put a link to that too, is uh, a group of individuals that I've come to know well over this last year and a half and uh, that are my go-to resources for uh, lots of uh, the questions you might have. Paula, anything you'd like to uh, say in closing? No, I just I appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity, Joe, to work with the medical devices group. I think it's a terrific network, and I would encourage the folks that uh, if, if you're if you're looking for work or looking for an opportunity, there's a lot of great resources on the medical devices group. Uh, and if you're an employer that's looking for uh, you know that next hire, there's a lot of terrific things you can do. I'll send some follow-up resources that will hopefully help, and uh, look forward to meeting everyone in Minneapolis next year. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, everyone. Jill and others that have asked questions that we didn't get to, we will. We will answer you offline. I also sent a link to uh, how you can find this replay later on, and I will send a broadcast email when we have the materials ready for you. Thank you, everyone, and good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.